Okay, good evening. So tonight's uh, topic of discussion is mind over matter. And there is a saying in Hasidus, it says, Moach shalit alalev, the mind controls the heart. And this is something that the question tonight we're going to discuss, can we actually control what is happening in our lives? Can you decide, can we decide how we feel when we experience something, an event, positive or negative? Is this something that is in our control? In the 1950s, 1960s was uh, the fa uh, person by the name Aaron Beck, <clears throat> and he developed the, the, the way of dealing of uh, what's called a cognitive behavioral therapy, CBT. And this was a little different than it was accepted back then in the in psychiatric world. And it was dealing with um, issues, with mental issues, by dealing with the roots of the thoughts and basically how one translates, interprets, how one interprets his, the events that is happening to the person. The result can be very different. Let's say, for example, you text someone, a friend, and the person doesn't answer you. So there's one person A can come up with a with the sides that, okay, the person didn't answer me, he must ignore me. And ignores me. Why? Maybe I'm, I'm he thinks uh, bad, he thinks low of me. This other person, this person, and per, another person can take it the same event and interpret it in a whole different way. Person didn't answer the text, okay, the person must be busy. So all of this is a method that uh, Dr. Beck developed in the cognitive behavioral therapy is to dealing with the person's thoughts and the thoughts that come to the person, sometimes you don't even notice those thoughts. They come instantly and you have to dig deep into the events that, that lead to these interpretations of the events the thoughts that lead to the interpretation of the events. And he, and this CBT uh, um, methods, he wrote in his book, is based on some earlier philosopher, the Stoic philosophers. But tonight we're going to discuss a similar concept. And we're gonna see that these ideas are really very strongly rooted in the Torah. And there is ways that the Torah deals with it. And especially we're going to discuss a letter that the Rebbe, the Tzemach Tzedek, the third Lubavitcher Rebbe wrote to a chassid that was dealing with some negative thoughts. And he was guiding him how to deal with those thoughts. And he, he basically gave him two ways, two methods of dealing with these thoughts, and we're going to discuss these two methods. So the, the discussion in our Torah portion is talking about the concept of the soldiers going fighting a war. This is as Moses, Moshe Rabbeinu continues to guide the Jewish people 
before entering the land of Israel. And he's telling them about what is going to happen. And he's also preparing them for events of war. Now there's going to be, they're going to have to fight war sometimes, and war can be scary. And here comes the Torah and gives us instructions. They had a Koyan standing and talking to the people and preparing them for war and telling them they should not fear. They should not fear, no matter what they see. So let's see the first text that we're reading. We're reading from today's portion. It says, When you go out to war against your enemies, and you see horses and chariots, a people more numerous than you, you shall not be afraid of them, for the Lord your God, the Lord your God is with you, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. So you can imagine the Torah instructs us not, not to be afraid of them. So what does that mean? It means that when you're, they're standing right there in, in war, when they're standing in war and they see the reality of war, the Torah says the Kohen comes and tells them and he guides them that when they see this, those scary things, they should not be afraid. It says, and it will be when you approach the battle that the priest shall come near and speak to the people. And he shall say to them here, O Israel, today <coughs> you are approaching the battle against your enemies. Let your heart not be faint. You shall not be afraid. And you shall not be alarmed. And you shall not be terrified because of them. For the Lord your God is, on, is the one who goes with you to fight for you against your enemies to save you. Okay, so when you are standing in their shoes, put yourself in their shoes, person is going to fight the war, and he's being told, don't be terrified. Now picture this, back the wars that took place in those days. You have these giant people with horses, with swords, with, with the... the seeing the people, the Goliath, standing in, in, uh, across the mountain. And you're told, don't be terrified. So if we look at it as a pep talk, as a nice, uh, what do you say, the <clears throat> preparation to be moral, to lift the, moral, the morale of the soldiers, I can understand it. The problem is that here the Torah says it's not just to lift up the morale, it says, hey, it's a pep talk to you, getting ready for the war, don't, don't be afraid, don't be scared. The Torah actually instructs us that this is a commandment. It's not just a, a morale booster. It is a commandment that the Torah commands you. You, are, you cannot be afraid. You cannot be terrified. How could you tell a person, don't be terrified? I am terrified. I see all these soldiers coming, the people killed. The screams of the battle, people are falling dead. Can you tell a person not to be terrified, not to be scared? So this is, this is the problem. And we, and we do find, Maimonides tells us that if a person is scared, if a person is terrified, he actually violates a mitzvah, a commandment in the Torah. Let's see the, the Maimonides, the way he writes it. We have been warned against fearing the enemy in war and not to flee from them. Rather, it is incumbent upon us to overcome, to stand, be strong against the other nation. 
Anyone who retreats and flees transgresses a negative commandment. Thus, the Supernal One has said, you should not be terrified because of them, thereby repeating the warning that you should not be afraid. The commandment is repeated to also imply that they should not flee or escape from battle. For only this way can be true faith be preserved. The law of this mitzvah explicated in the eighth chapter of Tractate of Saita. So to tell me that you cannot flee the war, I can understand that this is a commandment and this is really up to the person. You can decide to flee or not to flee. But again, how can you command a person not to be terrified? How could you command a person on an emotion? Emotion that comes as a result of a person's observation of the situation. You're in such a terrifying situation. So this is one question. And the fact is that the Torah, we know that if the Torah commands us, if the Torah commands us to not to be terrified, it has to be that this is something that is in, in our hands. Otherwise, the Torah would not command us. As we say, as we read in the, in the Pasuk, in the verse, it says, when you obey your Lord, the Lord your God to observe his commandments and his statutes, written in this Torah scroll. And when you return to the Lord your God with all your hearts and with all your soul, for this commandment which I command you this day is not concealed from you, nor is it far away. It is not in heaven that you should say, who will go up to heaven for us and fetch it for us, to tell it to us so that we can fulfill it. Nor is it beyond the sea that you should say who will cross the other side to the other side of the sea for us and fetch it for us to tell it to us so that we can fulfill it. Rather, this thing is very close to you. It is in your mouth, it is in your heart so that you can fulfill it. So this is the entire instructs us clearly. And God is telling us clearly that every commandment in the Torah, every commandment that God gives us is something that we can fulfill. So that's why we need to understand how can we apply this to the commandment, do not be terrified from the enemy. The truth is that there is a similar uh, uh, commandment on the other way, the other end, which is also something we read a couple of weeks ago, and that is, on the other end, the mitzvah of loving your fellow just like you love yourself. So here we can ask the really the exact same question. How can you command a person to love a fellow like you love yourself? Is that really doable? Is that really, can you, can you love another person as you love yourself? So actually, some of the sages and the commentators have struggled with that question. And because of that, some of them lowered the expectations of this mitzvah, if you want to call it this way. They said, you know, that this mitzvah is not really to feel a feeling of love. This is what the Nachmanadi said. It says, look, this is really a little bit of an exaggeration to expect a person to love somebody else like he loves himself. Let's see it inside what he says. He says, The phrase, love your neighbor as yourself, is an exaggeration, since the heart of a person will not accept that he loves his fellow as he loves himself. Moreover, it says, Rabbi Akiva has already taught, your life comes before the life of your fellow. Rabbi Akiva talks about a case when a person 
has just enough water just to save one life and he's walking with somebody else. And if both of them will drink, then they'll both die. So Rabbi Akiva says, you got to save your life first. So, so we see that based on this, the Nachmanidi says that really what it says, Ve'ahavta l'reyacha kamocha, so he says the word l'reyacha, you should love to your friend, to your friend. Don't say va'afta reyacha, love the friend. It says l'reyacha, meaning that you should act to your friends such like you act to yourselves. So that I can understand. That I can understand you when you're talking about acting towards somebody else in a similar way that I can understand. But, but can we really expect to love someone else like we love ourselves? So Nachmanidi says no. However, not everybody agrees with this. But those sages who say no. That if the, when the Torah says, it literally means you should love your friend like you love yourself. And this is what we need to understand. So, so the key to understand this is the notion that we cannot that we can control we cannot control our instinct but we do have a control over our conscious experience hasidic teachings discusses two distinct methods of bringing about this control the first method we might call the top-down method, the top-down approach. And the second is the bottom-up. Let's explain. There is a letter that the Rebbe, the Tzemach Tzedek, the third Lubavitcher Rebbe, wrote to a chassid that was dealing with, as I mentioned before, it was dealing with some uh, negative thoughts. <clears throat> And the Tzemach Tzedek wrote him a letter explaining how a person is really in control of his thoughts. Let's, <clears throat> let's see the letter inside, part of the letter. It says, every person Again, it says, every person has three soul garments, which are the faculties of thoughts, speech, and action. They are the primary factors in a person's conduct. And in each of them, we have free will and the power to think, to speak, and to act as the mind wills. That's why they're called garments. What is a garment? A garment is something you take off and you put on. They're the garments of the soul. The thinking, speaking, and doing are things that you can decide what you think, you can decide what you're speaking, you can decide what you do. Even if there is fear in one's heart, it is possible to remove it through thought, speech, and action. The key is to not think or speak about it at all, but to do the opposite. As it is written in Likute Yamarim, that's the book of Tanya in chapter 14. Thus, we have been commandment, do not be afraid, which means do not think about the fear. The Rambam in the laws of kings and wars, the chapter seven, has ruled accordingly that anyone who frightens himself and thinks, and thinks thoughts of fear transgresses a negative commandment. As soon as one completely desists from said thoughts, the fear in their heart will automatically dissipate. Or at the very least, 
that fear will immediately become as dormant and imperceptible to the body. And then, after a few days, it will dissipate completely so that it won't enter one's mind at all. Even as an intrusive thought, this is the meaning of the commandment, do not let your heart be afraid. So, so what, what is the Tzemach Tzedek saying? Basically, what he's telling us, if you look a little deeper into this psychological anatomy described in this Hasidic thought, we can understand the mechanics of what the Tzemach Tzedek is describing in this letter. In brief, the soul is composed of various cognitive and emotive powers. You can refer to it as seichel and midot, the intellect, intellectual, and emotional capacities. Generally speaking, our feelings about a given object are only generated once we perceive, process, and focus, and focus on the object. The power to focus on something is referred to in Hasidic teachings as the attribute of Da'at. Da'at is knowledge. Knowledge knowing, but you know, we, in, the, in the intellectual part of the person, we have, Hasidus explains, has three parts, as Chachma, Bina, and Da'at, Chabad. The Chachma, Bina are more the intellectual part, the da, the knowledge, is more a connecting to what you know. It is a knowledge that you connect to. And that is called a gateway to the midot. A gateway from the intellectual attachment to our emotive attachment. You become emotionally attached once you think and you connect to it intellectually. So the more you, a, a person is able to think and control his thoughts, the more he will be able to control the emotions. Because anything you feel, you must think it first. And sometimes the thinking is subconsciously, but nevertheless it is a thinking. And the more, and, and the thinking process is something, is an exercise that a person just like the body needs to be exercised, a person needs to exercise his mind as well. There's a fascinating story with the Hasid of the Alter Rebbe. I'm sure some of you know it already. This Hasid, his name, he was one of the, the youngest Hasidim of the Alter Rebbe. His name was Moshe Meislish. He was a very learned person. He was knowledgeable in different languages. And during the, the war of uh, Napoleon with Russia, the Alter Rebbe sent him to become a spy. So a spy in the Russian, I'm, I'm sorry, to become a spy in the French army to a spy to, uh, in favor of the Russians. So he came there and he volunteered and, and then as a translator and he actually was among the, the head command where they planned the wars and he was able to deliver the plans to the Russians. And at one point, he was standing there in the middle of the planning of the war and all of a sudden he describes, he said, the, he said later on, I'm sorry, I should start this before I said the story. He said that later on that the Aleph base of Hasidus saved his life. The beginning, the, the foundation of Hasidus saved his life. He said what happened there, he was standing in the middle of this planning of the war and all of a sudden the door breaks open. And they thought for a moment that the Russians came to attack this headquarters. But it wasn't the Russians. It was none other than Napoleon himself. 
He stormed into the room. And he says, what's going on? What's with the plans? Where are we going? Is the plans ready? And then he sees this chassid. And he right away says, who is this stranger? And he, and he walks straight towards him and he, and he grabbed him and he put his hand on his chest to see if his heart beats faster than usual. And he said, and that's when he said that my Aleph base of Hasidis saved my life. The Aleph base, the foundation of Hasidis that teaches that the mind should control the heart. Normally, instinctively, anyone, and in this situation, would start knowing that he knows that he's a spy. He would be feared. You know, obviously, we know what the consequences would be. And that is a, a very the instinctive feeling of anyone, is that the heart should start beating fast and would be scared, scared to death. But his mind told him that he cannot be scared. Is this an easy thing to do? Absolutely not. It is a very difficult thing. To control your emotions is very difficult. To tell your heart, to tell your your heart what to feel and what not to feel in a time like this but it take but it took practice and it says Hasidus in general teaches a person to constantly exercise this practice of the mind should control the heart my heart someone said something not nice to me and instinctively I want to answer him and tell him off Control it. Have your mind control your emotions, your action. Control. Discipline yourself. And this is an, ex an exercise that takes years to perfect. I so it was a uh, chassid once in, in Russia. There was a time when there was some kind of a plague and people were... All, uh, the body was all kind of uh, itching, pimples and... and, and and everybody was, it was very itchy, people were scratching and was bleeding, they were bleeding. And this chassid walked in the street and a friend of his sees him and he sees that a guy is not bleeding. Everybody in the town was bleeding from scratching all of these contagious pimples and he wasn't. So the chassid, the friend asked him, how come you're not bleeding? This is because I'm not scratching. I said, what do you mean you're not scratching? Doesn't it itch? He says, yes, it itches. So what? He said, discipline. It itches, but it didn't scratch. It is, takes a lot, a long, uh, a very strong discipline in the mind. That the mind should control the heart. And this is a matter of exercise. This is, says that Tzemach Tzedek is the way, the method of the Da'at knowing the knowledge that this is the key of all the emotions. Let's see how the Tzemach Tzedek says inside. It says, when one withdraws thoughts from something, the fear subsides. The reason for this is because the intellectual and emotional attributes are sustained by that, the focus, attention which is called by the Zohar in re reference to its role in directing the six primary emo emotional attributes, the key that contains six. That's what the Zohar says about the that, the, the, this part that controls the emotions. And it is only through the medium of thoughts that that is able to invest itself in the midot emotional attributes. Therefore, by withdrawing one's thought, that is removed from the emotional attribute in question. And then the emotional at attribute is deactivated as if it never was. 
That's what the Tzimach Tzedek says. That when you do this, you are able to control the emotions. And when you control the emotions, so that the same thing is true with the story of the mitzvah that we read in the parsha about the war. So when you do see everything what you are surrounded, all these scary things, says the Torah, one needs to control his thoughts. Don't allow, don't allow a thought of fear enter your mind. Immediately think of the, the, the other things. Think of the positive things. When you are able to control your thoughts, then you will be able to affect your emotions. And that's a Martel continues, and he says, in, in the main, the diverse, diversion of that and of one's thought is achieved by guarding one's thoughts and by investing them elsewhere. This can, be even, this can even be in worldly matters. If they are pressing or positive and in God's Torah, which gladdens the, the heart each and every day by, by setting fixed time for Torah study, especially when together with, an, with another study partner. So when you focus your mind in positive, you focus your mind in Torah, you focus your mind with a friend and helping with, together with a friend and focusing your mind in a positive way, that enables your knowledge, your thoughts to control your emotions. So this is one method, as we called it, the top down. There is also, but sometimes that doesn't help. Sometimes you can try and try and try. You have certain issues that bother you, certain issues that make you depressed. Problems, all kinds of issues. And you're trying to control your mind and to say, no, let me, let me think, I'm going to think positive, but it doesn't work. Not always does it work. As we said before, it is a, a, a thing that takes years of exercising. And you start it by small things. But still, there is also another method, another approach to emotional discipline. And that is, but by directing from the bottom-up approach. This is also suggested by the Tzemach Tzedek in that same letter and that he explained to this Chassid that there is another method also. And what, is, what is the other method? Let's see it inside the way the Tzemach Tzedek writes it. It says, what's more, a person ought to be very careful not to speak of any melancholy matters. To the contrary, one ought to exhibit joyous mannerism, as though his heart was filled with happiness, even if at the time his heart is not. It eventually will be. The reason for this is that the deeds and, act and the activities a person performs subsequently becomes fixed in his heart. As the Rambam writes, he should perform once, a second time, then a third. The, the actions he does because they are reasonable. And then those attributes will be affixed in his heart. What is he saying? He's saying that sometimes you, you, can, you have to start, you have to start the car, not with the engine. I remember in, in Yerushalayim, there was a lot of 
uh, shift, the cars with the shift, gear, gear shift, you know, not the automatic shift. And sometimes in the winter when the battery didn't work, you couldn't start the car with the engine. We get a few people to stake and push the car and push, push and push and let them run. And as it gains a little speed, all of a sudden, boom, then and the engine goes out. It is something that sometimes we need to do is to act happily. To do, sometimes if, you can, if it doesn't work from the thoughts down, it can work from the feet up. Now, when a person acts in a positive, in actively with dancing, with singing, when you're in a bad mood, walk into a, room, into a wedding, people are dancing, people are singing, and people are joyous, and you're entering this dance, and you start dancing with them, even if you're in the bad mood, it's not going to take long that your mood is going to change. You're going to become happy. Nothing changed in your life, but the mood is going to change because you acted in a happy way. When you act in a happy way, it affects your feelings as well. That's what the Tzemach Tzedek says is the second approach. So, the same thing is true when it comes to the mitzvahs that we discussed. We discussed the mitzvah of not to be f- fearful. Is acting not fearful? Why do they, what do they do in the armies when they get the prep the people, they get to make them march, they make them sing, they make them lift the morale because those actions also lifts them up. And the same thing is also true with Avas Israel. Avat Israel, love your fellow Jew. So these, there too, you have the two approaches from the top down. When you, th- when you think about another person, think about the positive qualities of that person. Try to focus on the good things, especially when the way it explains in the Hasidus, in the Tanya, that a fellow person, a fellow Jew, is different from us only in body, but not in the neshama. And when you think about what is the true essence of a person, what is our true selves, our true selves, is it the body or or is it the soul? So when you think about this soul part, then you realize that the other person is just as one as you are. You're one. So the, those thoughts is from the top down. Thinking positive thoughts about someone else. That can lead to feelings of love. And if that doesn't work, you, you also use the other methods from the bottom up. Act to a person in kind ways. Be nice to the person. As the Baal Shem Tov said, let's see what the, the Baal Shem Tov talks about this. I'm going to read, see it inside. It says, to love one's fellow Jew is a biblical command. The Baal Shem Tov work with regard to Ahavat Israel to demonstrate the why of loving another Jew. For every Jew, there is a why we must love them. The Baal Shem Tov's accomplishment was to put on view the po- uh, uh, to put on the view the positive qualities in the other person. If a person does not see any positive qualities, the deficiency lies not with the other person, but with the viewer. He does not see the other person's positive qualities. So to conclude, what do we take from here? So obviously this is a very practical advice that we regain from this teaching of the Torah about not fearing and about loving that the Torah does command us to control our emotions and when you exercise this it can help you obviously not just with fulfilling the commandments of the Torah but it helps you with your own mental 
an emotional state as well. That when you learn how to deal, how to focus and think positively, and when some negative thoughts comes to your mind, you right away push it away. Sometimes we don't pay attention to those thoughts. But the more you exercise this, the more you will be aware of the thoughts that enter your mind that you, that you didn't pay attention to. And those thoughts need to be, need to be examined. That's what we're standing now in the month of Elo coming in, Rosh Chodesh Elo coming soon. And Rosh Chodesh Elo is exactly the same thing. It says on the month of Elo, Hashem comes and brings His tremendous light. God is like a king who comes close to us. And if we appreciate that, we know that we can take this tremendous energy that God gives us and to be able to focus on them and thereby affect our feelings and our emotions as we get prepared for the new year. And it works from the bottom up as well, that we need to act in acts of goodness and kindness in this month. We add in tzedakah giving, we add in Torah studying, we add in prayers, we sound the shofar, we examine our deeds. All those things are positive things that we act positively and thereby this enables us to feel the positive feeling and to connect with a higher connection with Hashem. And may Hashem help that we all should have a good year. Aksiva v'chasim ateva, a good kibench to you. To us and all Israel, we should have Mashiach very, very soon. Anyone has any questions, uh, you can unmute yourself and you can ask any questions if you want to discuss this.